Trust me, I know. There are few topics in software development as boring as security. And this is ironic because writing secure code is literally the most important thing you have to do if you don't want to end up being that guy who stored all customer passwords in blank and then leaked them by mistake on a public endpoint. But there is nothing glamorous or exciting about security work. When you do this work well, nothing visible actually happens, so apparently there is no progress, no customer will thank you, and no manager will praise your work. However, if there is a security incident, all hell breaks loose and everybody agrees that you should have done more, sooner, with fewer resources, under tighter deadlines and somehow without slowing down feature delivery. Security is the only part of engineering where success is invisible and failure is a public execution. So, naturally, nobody wants to touch it. But, whether we like it or not, we are in the era of AI slop and auto-generated code, so security incidents will occur much more often. And, if you want job security, you can easily be the white knight in shining armor, riding his yellow rubber duck, knowing the basics of security. And the best way to start is by reviewing OWASP's top 10 security threats in 2025. If you are not familiar with it, the Open Worldwide Application Security Project is a non-profit that's been quietly holding the internet together with duct tape and public PDFs for over two decades. They maintain a giant catalog of weaknesses, patterns, testing guides, cheat sheets and vulnerabilities that every developer should read, but most of us never do unless we are already in trouble. The biggest security risk in 2025 is, once again, broken access control, also known as that thing you usually solve by adding a random third-party security middleware in your project. The vulnerability showed up in almost 4% of the tested applications and, famously, it was even present in Next.js a few months back when a bug allowed attackers to bypass authorization simply by setting a special HTTP header. So access control enforces policy such that users cannot act outside of their intended permissions. In plain terms, user A can't get any of the private data associated with user B and, more importantly, user A can't get any admin roles if they are not allowed to. To prevent incidents, unless something is explicitly public, deny access by default. Don't scatter access rules across the app. Security code should be implemented only once in a single place and then reused across the app. Allowing cores is common these days because front-end apps running at different ports need access to your server. However, make sure this is not used excessively. Stateful session identifiers should be invalidated on the server after logout and stateless JWT tokens should be short-lived to minimize the window of opportunity for an attacker. More importantly, enforce record-level ownership. You shouldn't allow users to query records they don't own just because the endpoint is technically open. If user A is trying to read user B's invoice, something should break loudly. The second most popular security vulnerability is security misconfiguration. It happens when systems, services, or infrastructure are deployed with insecure defaults, missing hardening, or wide-open permissions. You are vulnerable if your app ships with exposed admin panels, verbose error messages, or cloud buckets that you assume are private just because you never checked. And I know we have at least one public access S3 bucket that should be private as we speak. To prevent security misconfigurations, treat your setup like production from day one. Automate a hardened baseline config across all environments and then loosen up requirements for dev and test environments. Don't leave sample apps, debug tools or unused services lying around. Check your cloud permissions, don't trust defaults and double check that what you think is private actually is. If you're not auditing your setup regularly, something's probably already wide open. And don't worry, performing a basic, sensible security audit is pretty easy these days and it is yet another skill useful to have in this day and age. Now the third security risk is a fan favorite in the web dev community. Enter the software supply chain failures, also known as the NPM package I was using to compare numbers, just started mining crypto. This risk used to be about outdated dependencies, but now it covers the full chaos of modern software delivery, ranging from compromised packages to rogue maintainers or poisoned Docker images. It ranked number one in the OWASP community survey, with 50% of respondents putting it at the top. And, even though it's hard to test for, the few incidents that were reported had the highest average impact and exploitability. This one is the easiest to prevent as well. You know, just don't use shady shit that strangers hand out for free. This applies to both coding and parties as well. Next on the list is cryptographic failures. You're vulnerable if you're still using MD5 or SHA1, rolling your own random number generators or storing secrets in plain text. You get extra vulnerability points if you are committing private keys into source control. So the first rule to prevent such vulnerabilities is to use common sense and don't commit any passwords or keys to your repository. 
Then, make sure all sensitive data is encrypted when in transit using modern secure protocols. Passwords need to be hashed using modern, adaptive algorithms like Argon2 or Bcrypt, and you should stop using outdated crypto libraries or random code generated by an AI chatbot. Injection is the fifth vulnerability on the list, and probably the only one you still remember from that one web security class you took in university before switching back to React tutorials. At its core, injection happens when you feed untrusted input into an interpreter without properly handling it. That could be an SQL query, a shell command, a search filter in your ORM, or even a server-side template. The system treats it as code instead of data, so if your user's first name is Drop Database, you might be in big trouble. The fix is conceptually simple, but rarely followed. Data and commands should be kept separate. The good news is that modern frameworks actually give you most of the tools to do this right. You gain access to parameterized queries, input sanitization and escaping mechanisms, but you also have to use them properly. And, yes, prompt injection is now a thing. So if you're feeding user input into your LLM wrapper without strict context management, congrats, you've just recreated SQL injection, except this time it costs more, it hallucinates with confidence, and still leaks everything you didn't mean to expose. Insecure design is sixth on the list, and this one is a bit broader in scope, since this is impacted by your architectural decisions. For instance, consider that you build a feature that lets users preview a document and then forget to check if they actually owned it. Or you implement a backdoor for admin access and you don't realize that regular users can get really easy access to it as well. It's also important to note that there is a difference between design flaws and implementation defects. They have different root causes, take place at different times in the development process, and have different remediations. A secure design can still have implementation defects leading to vulnerabilities that may be exploited. Avoiding insecure design is a bit more complicated as well because you actually need experience and a good understanding of both your software tools and the actual product. You need to think like a malicious user before you ever write a single line of code. Next, the authentication failure vulnerability is a really straightforward one. It occurs when a system can't reliably verify who a user is. In other words, the attacker pretends to be someone they're not and the system believes them. This vulnerability includes everything from brute forcible login forms to broken session handling and insecure forgot password flows. To prevent authentication failures, start by enforcing strong long passwords and block from the start known common passwords. Enable multi-factor authentication when possible, don't allow unlimited login attempts, rate limit authentication requests, and introduce increasing delays. I know all these take time and effort, but brute forcing passwords these days is easier than ever, especially with leaked databases floating around and GPU farms being rented for pennies. In the eighth place, we have software or data integrity failures, which are caused by trusting malicious code or data. Anytime you treat unverified code or data as safe, you're opening the door to attackers. If your app auto-updates without checking signatures, if your pipeline pulls artifacts from random URLs, if your serialized objects can be modified by users, or if you rely on functionality from domains you don't control, you're giving attackers all the space they need to slip malicious code into your system. Preventing this starts with treating integrity as non-negotiable. Use digital signatures to check that the code or data you're consuming hasn't been tampered with and only pull dependencies from trusted repositories. If you're in a higher-risk environment, host your own internal mirror with vetted packages, so you're not relying on the good behavior of strangers. Next, logging and monitoring failures are also a vulnerability because the worst thing that can happen is for your application to be exploited and you don't even notice. This category is often ignored because developers think logging is mostly for debugging purposes. But if you're not logging authentication attempts, permission changes, unexpected errors, or access to sensitive endpoints, then you're missing the only breadcrumbs that could tell you something's wrong. To prevent this, set up centralized, temper-resistant logging from the beginning, monitor critical flows, and alert on suspicious activity like multiple failed login attempts or users accessing data outside their normal scope. Finally, on number 10, we got mishandling of exceptional conditions, which is a new category for 2025. It focuses on improper error handling, logical errors, failing open, and other related scenarios stemming from corner case scenarios. As a practical example, Cloudflare brought the internet down last week because of improper error handling of a file that was larger than it was supposed to be. These conditions include everything from null pointer dereferences and missing parameters, to exposing stack traces in production, failing to check permissions before executing an operation, or just assuming every function will behave as expected under every condition. To prevent it, always assume failure will happen and build for failure first. 
Monitoring is also important because if the same error shows up a thousand times in a minute, you should probably stop your YouTube binging and do something about it. If you liked this video, you should check out some of these ones next. Also, please violently smash all the buttons YouTube is throwing at you these days, and until next time, thank you for watching.